The Hebrew Bible of Critical Edition uh, is headed by Ron Handel of Berkeley, and that involves a whole team of editors uh, in which a, a, an edition would be produced. It, really, it would be the text, there would be variant readings, there would be an apparatus, which means notes at the bottom, and then there would be a commentary. Our editions have all been based on one manuscript. We call that a diplomatic text. If you look at Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, our Hebrew Bible, from which our English translations are made, they are based on one manuscript, the Leningrad Codex. A critical edition is something a bit different. It's trying to arrive at the best text of Scripture. Very often it will be very much like our traditional text, but sometimes there will be readings in a critical edition that are different from our traditional text. Psalm 145 is an acrostic psalm. It's missing a verse in our traditional text. And uh, scholars have wondered about this. Why is a certain verse missing, the nun verse? Why is that missing in our traditional text, as found in the King James and many other Bibles? And, and there's been speculation. Uh, was this, did this verse get dropped out of Scripture? Did, did, did God leave it out? Why is there a missing verse in Psalm 145? And by the way, we know it's missing because in an alphabetical psalm, you need 22 letters, 22 verses, because of the Hebrew alphabet, but we have 21. So, so when we come to the great psalm scroll from Qumran, we find the missing verse. Now that is very interesting because scholars had speculated that there was a missing verse. Now we find in, in glorious black and white, or in color in our scroll, we find a missing verse. So this would be an example as to how we can arrive at the best text of Scripture. In, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible, the critical edition, that verse would be in the main text. So the presentation uh, of, of, of DJD 32 was in two volumes. Now, for, for the, the um, the Edmunds project, we've opted to do a, an English translation. And of course one has to make a choice there. Unfortunately, producing photographs is far too expensive. So these really are out of the question for the, for the more popular Edmunds book. So what we will have is, is, a, is a facing Hebrew text and English translation. And then underneath there will be variant readings and also uh, some commentary, a little bit of commentary. But, but you could say this would be a more popular version of, of the Isaiah Scrolls, of the Great Isaiah Scroll for, for, for the public and for students. What people want to know is, you know, what does the Hebrew say, what does the English say, and how does it differ from our Bibles? And that's what we aim to present in the Erdman's edition of, of the Great Isaiah Scroll. Now, if you go to Cave 1, where the first Dead Sea Scrolls were found, it is very interesting in that we have two copies of the Book of Isaiah. And these two seem to represent two groups of biblical texts in a way. The most famous of them is the Great Isaiah Scroll. Um, I'll hold up a picture here. We have, this is from the edition. The Great Isaiah Scroll is the best known of all the Dead Sea Scrolls. But we also have another scroll called 1Q Isaiah B, the Hebrew, the Hebrew University Isaiah scroll. And these represent uh, almost like two groups of scholarship. The Hebrew University Isaiah scroll is very close to the traditional Masoretic text. It's very close indeed. The great Isaiah scroll is more free in its, trans, in, in its presentation. The, the arrangement of verses and the uh, order of, of, of chapters is, is, is as we know it in, for Isaiah, all 66 chapters. But there seems to be more freedom on the part of the scribe here.